Welcome, my name is uh, Chad Depew. I'm the uh, uh, founder of a consultant, consultancy called Anaka, um, and now the CTO of a company called WhisperText. Uh, I'm definitely an Erlang fan uh, and a Redis fan, uh, and so I've sort of put those two things together with uh, some friends of mine and uh, coworkers uh, to uh, do a bit of an experimental project that I'm gonna tell you guys about today. So really quick, uh, Anaka is, is my company. We have 25 developers um, doing a lot of high performance apps, um, iOS and, and um, Android mostly, typically um, funded startups. Um, one of them actually was a company called Whisper um, and they uh, have recently um, uh, closed a series B and then I actually sort of came on board with them. So uh, they're uh, probably the largest social network that no one in this room has ever heard of. Um, it's sort of a place to share uh, in a safe way your sort of things you don't post on Facebook and Twitter. Like, you know, people spend a lot of time managing their, their um, personal brand. Like, everyone has a personal brand these days. Uh, so this is sort of a place where you can, uh, you can not manage your personal brand and talk about the things you like. Actually, so really quick, I'm just going to, I thought it'd be kind of funny because it's, there's a lot of interesting stuff on there. Uh, so I... I found a few with the word conference in them. Uh, we haven't rolled out search yet, but you can on the website. It's actually totally an app. It's not really a, a web thing at all uh, yet. But uh, so it was like, uh, I'm attending a psychology conference in three weeks. Secretly, I'm hoping I'll meet the man of my dreams there. Uh, you know, this, this kind of stuff, very like sort of confessional. Um, hello, sir, I must ask you a question. I don't know what that is. Oh, did it go away? Sorry, I didn't, I can't, I, I apologize here. Uh, that's really weird that it, uh, here we go. So, really quick. Um, they're all sort of like, very confessional and artistic. Um, uh, some of them are very vulnerable. I miss my ex-husband, he's sitting next to me at this conference and I, I made a huge mistake. So some of them are really vulnerable. Some of them are just kind of funny. Um, you know, and they're all, a lot of them are, are sort of focused around nearby. So if, if you, you know, uh, in a place where you use Whisper, you'll see people, uh, um, you know, you'll see like a, it'll get an alert that it's near you. So there's a, it's actually quite a big social network. It's about two and a half billion uh, page views a month. So it's um, pretty large. So anyway, um, really quick, let me fix my display here. I apologize. I probably shouldn't have gone off script here. All right. So um, so anyway, I in the course of of doing some pretty interesting scale build, you know, scalable projects. Um, I came up with this idea to build a Redis clone in Erlang called Edis. Um, so Redis is basically, uh, I'm assuming most people here are familiar with Redis. Um, it's sort of like, you know, um, the Swiss Army knife of the internet now. Um, so, you know, essentially it's a C, C base. It's really fast. Uh, it's disk backed, but obviously people don't really use it for that other than just sort of backup. Um, and, you know, Edis is very similar other than it's actually um, disk backed by default, and it's actually more focused around having larger than RAM keys, uh, you know, key value stores. So um, I just want to be really clear up front too, I love Redis, so this talk is, is sort of an homage to Redis, so it's not, a, um, uh, it's not to bash Redis at all. In fact, um, it's, yeah, it's sort of an inspiration in many ways. Uh, and also, Edis isn't fit to tie the shoes of Redis, to be really clear, I mean, this is an experimental project. So, um, really quickly, so basically, um, Edis uh, is an Erlang-based server that uses a lot of the uh, OTP um, behaviors, Gen TCP, Gen FSM. Um, it has a level DB backend by default. Uh, it doesn't have to use level DB; it's pluggable, um, and it essentially respects the Redis, uh, you know, big O times. So in other words, all the algorithms uh, that you use in Redis um, are the same uh, in, in terms of. Um, Complex, time complexity, not in terms of speed, it's definitely slower, but in, uh, in terms of time complexity. So, uh, you know, Redis is obviously great because it's fast and it's got these great commands and it's really easy to deploy. Um, I, I don't know how many people are really familiar with the Redis commands. Um, one I really like is uh, rpop lpush. I don't know who's familiar with that command. It's, uh, yeah, a few people. It's really great. So I can, like, create a work queue. Um, I can basically throw some work in it, IDs, whatever. Um, and then I can have another key that's like a run queue. Um, I can basically uh, atomically pop from one and push to the other. Um, and that, you know, I, it's in some ways in Erlang, a lot of these sort of things are not as useful because Erlang, it's at some level sort of 
is a giant you know, set of queues and, uh, or, or uh, mailboxes, processes with mailboxes. But um, particularly in, in sort of um, higher level languages, it's really, really powerful. So uh, it's atomic and it, um, you know, it essentially allows you to do some really interesting stuff around um, uh, making sure, you know, uh, coordinating among, for instance, a bunch of Ruby or Python requests uh, that are on separate servers. So uh, the Redis design decisions, you know, data's uh, in memory. There was a long time ago a non, like you could do virtual memory, but it, it just didn't perform very well. Um, it has a master-slave model, although um, Salvatore is working on a, um, like a sharded cluster that's not out yet. Um, and then it has scripting, so you can do some logical stuff, but that, that sort of blocks the thread. So one thing I've found is that people that are using serious Redis just don't use scripting very much. Um, or, and they don't use sort of key search because key search and scripting will you know, block the thread. The other thing I found is most people will run more than one Redis on the server. If they have like a four core server, they'll run four red eye so they can um, you know, get maximum use of the CPUs. So Edis design decisions are a little different. So it's disk back by default. It has a pluggable DB. Um, it has master slave and then we're working on master master and then it's extensible with Erlang. So, um, as I mentioned, it, it respects the time complexity. And actually, there's one caveat, which is with Z sets, um, there's no concept of, well, there's no off the shelf uh, implementation of uh, skip lists, and I haven't had time to write it, so, uh, or anyone else. So, um, Z sets has, um, I, I think, like log in time complexity, and, um, and then edit sets, uh, Z sets are not. They're just, uh, uh, they're in. So, um, Use cases basically, um, so there are people use that are using Edis. What, what I've found is that they're actually using it more as a proxy. So they've taken like the stuff that we wrote and they stripped out all the backend stuff and they wrote their own like proxy where they're sort of, you know, load balancing as a smart proxy between Redis's. So they have real Redis's behind the scenes and they're actually using it to speak the protocol, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then it's just kind of an interesting reference protocol implementation. So I'm going to really quickly go through kind of how it works, we're gonna actually, uh, I'm gonna show you guys a bit about how to build a server like this at Erlang. Um, and then we're gonna actually uh, trace through a command and then we're gonna talk through kind of the replication and uh, uh, multi-master stuff. And then we might be able to demo, demo multi-master. So um, it, who, who here is like, I guess I'm wondering who here is not familiar with Erlang at any level? Okay, good, there's some people, that's great. So I'm gonna give you the worst overview of Erlang you've ever heard. Um, so all the people here that really know about Erlang are gonna um, give me like, you know, red cards at the end of the talk. So um, 45 seconds, so pattern matching is sort of the name of the game. It's a functional language. Um, it, variables are not able to be uh, reassigned. Um, it, it, Erlang has a sort of a concept of like a virtual machine with uh, sort of green threads, if you will. Um, they're like these lightweight pro processes that you can have like, you know, 10 million on your MacBook um, and you can create them nearly instantly. Um, and uh, essentially, you can only pass messages between these processes. So uh, if you want to communicate, like Erlang is actually incredibly object oriented. If you think about it, it's sort of like almost the fundamental idea of object orientation, which is you create this process and you can only pass messages to it. Um, and it has its own internal state. That's Erlang. So on top of that, people build this, um, build on top of Erlang, these sort of really simple primitives with this thing called the open telecom platform. People just call it OTP. Essentially this thing called a gen server, um, it's sort of the core building block of Erlang. You'll see that in here. And a gen FSM is like a more complicated version of a gen server. Um, these are, think of these as like loop. They're like little pieces, little processes with an event loop that I can send messages to and they're gonna basically do things for me. Um, and you have this concept of supervisor tree and supervisors can essentially uh, manage these servers, restart them when they die. So like a normal Erlang system would never need to be rebooted in theory because I can always like, if something dies, just kill that one little piece of it, it's gonna keep running. So uh, if you want to learn more, get all three major Erlang books. Um, if you read Joe Armstrong's book, you'll become a believer. I just made it up about 10 minutes ago, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, uh, no, seriously, all three of these major books are great. Um, and it, I really think it's worth learning about Erlang if you haven't. Um, it's, it just makes you think differently, even if you decide it's not the right fit for what you're doing. So um, I'm going to dive into the structure of the app really quick. So um, essentially, there's a supervisor tree. So, um, in Erlang, every app you'll see these supervisors. You'll see uh, uh, essentially a. Um, uh, let's see if I can get to the. Can't do a pointer here. That's all right. Um, you'll see the um, the main supervisor, and then it has a series of um, database list supervisors, and then a listener. So 
Um, if I actually, uh, when I boot up an Edis server, it's going to actually create an Erlang process for each database, and then it's going to create a, a client listener and a client manager. So um, I'm going to kind of walk through some code really here, so really quick here. So um, essentially, uh, uh, this is typical you know, Erlang code. It's a little bit hard to read uh, at first, but once you realize it's very simple, it's, it's, uh, there's not a lot of uh, sort of different constructs. It's, it's not too bad. So um, I'm actually going to create this sort of um, list of um, listeners, and uh, each listener is going to call, uh, each supervisor is going to call this edis listener. That's going to, uh, the supervisor will create like a whole group of these. And you can see on there at the bottom it says, okay, one for one, five, ten listeners. That means that um, I, it'll know how to restart these things, and it knows that, uh, you know, if, if, if like as long as not more than uh, ten die in five seconds, um, then uh, it can just keep restarting them. So essentially it's sort of like uh, a little bit of a, it'll, it'll sort of keep the system running. So um, I create those listeners, um, and then I actually, uh, those listeners, when a connection comes in, a client manager is created, and a client manager has these two sort of sub-processes, like a client and a, um, uh, and a command runner. So what I can do is, um, the thing that's really cool about Erlang 2 is it has a lot of great uh, sort of protocol uh, TCP support built in. I can basically just say, okay, I want to listen on this connection, uh, on the socket. I want to, um, I want you to actually send me the inbound data uh, as uh, packets that are line delimited. So I don't have to worry actually about even parsing the uh, inbound uh, protocol from Redis because Redis is a very simple text-based protocol. And uh, what happens is inside this little uh, uh, Edis client here, the uh, uh, we have a state, and the state is called command start. So command start is where we start. We have um, uh, uh, you know, sort of a holding place uh, called uh, state here that holds our internal state. And essentially what we're going to do is we can actually um, sort of we're going to traverse through these different states. It's a finite state machine picking off pieces of these commands. So you're going to see here basically uh, uh, each command is going to have, at the end of its return, it says, okay, great, I'm done. The next state is some other state, and then it's, it's really complicated the way they describe it, but essentially, here's my internal state, and here's the name of the state I'm in. So it's sort of like you're going to move around from state to state, and I'll show you an example in a second. What we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to go in here. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead and show you guys. So for a typical Redis command, like I want to you know, set uh, a key value. So I'm going to set my key lang equal erlang. This is what happens over the wire. Essentially, um, there's a, a, a series of commands. We say, hey, here's the number of parameters. Here's the length of the first parameter. Here's the command. Here's the length of the second one, et cetera, down to the end. And these are all really simple like text-based um, commands that are uh, carriage return line feed delimited. And then the server is going to respond. So that's like actually a, quite a simple state machine. And so what we're going to do is I'm actually going to show you guys sort of one of the great things about Erlang in terms of how it's very easy to build a state machine that would parse commands, you know, like a Redis protocol. So um, at the top here, you can actually see the, uh, the state we're in. It says we're in state. Uh, we actually, our, our process gets in a message. It gets a tuple, which is this little curly brace thing. It says TCP, here's the port, here's some data. So star three, which means that there's going to be three parameters, and we're in command start. So then it says, okay, I'm switching now to state arg size. Cool. So now I'm going to hop over to arg size. Great. Now I'm there. Okay. So now I'm waiting on essentially the number of arguments. So the next command that comes in uh, off the socket uh, is, okay, great. We've got a new message, TCP. Uh, here's your argument size. Okay. Uh, actually, so I think it's funny because I think the arg size, yeah, the arg size is correct because it's, it's set. So the next is the actual arg. So now we're in the command name state. So you can see up at the top here we're at command name state and uh, we're waiting now on arg size again. We have a command, what's next? So we're going to kind of hop through, we're in the argument, now we're in the arg size again, now we're back in argument, now we're uh, back in um, uh, the, the actual data that comes in. And each time, so for instance here it says dollar sign five is telling you how, how big the data is. So it's going to tell us how much data is coming in. So we get that um, and then we're actually done. So at this point, we know we got a message uh, to run this command set with these parameters, and now we're going to run that command. So at this point, Erlang did this work to sort of like listen on a socket. It gets all these inbound messages. Uh, it doesn't even have to parse them. It's quite simple to just get uh, the actual runtime to send you these if they're, if they're um, uh, carriage return line to be terminated. I've got a message. Now I'm going to do something with it. 
Okay, so at this point now, I can actually run the command, and um, I'm going to go into that in a second. So our runner essentially is, um, there's a couple different states you can be in for Redis. So with Redis, you can actually um, have other people that are subscribing to you. You can actually do this thing called pub sub, where I can like, um, I can actually listen on a key, and as people publish to that, then I'll actually get, the, the slaves will get those messages. So we have a bit of a state there that we need to walk through, and I'm not going to do that, I'm just trying to show you guys that it exists. Um, and then we're gonna you know, run the command. So uh, we get this inbound message run, it has the command, it has the arguments. We say, okay, what are we gonna do? What state are we in? We're in, are we in multi-queue? Are we in uh, um, pub sub? Are we just in regular run mode? And then we actually run the command. So, um, and then we, um, we actually, we parse the command and then we run the command. So at that point we said we got a set operation, we don't need to do something on it. Um, we have been through the, the whole process of, of parsing the command, and so now we're actually gonna do the work of running it. So in this case, um, in EdisDB, I'm gonna go back really quick to show you guys, essentially it's a separate process. So um, if you look here, the EdisDBs are actually separate processes. So in, in, in Redis, you've got one main thread. Everything's sort of its own. There's, there's actually one just sort of giant loop. Everything happens in line. Um, and in, in Redis, essentially, every database has its own process. So they're all running in parallel. Um, as commands come in, um, commands can be operating on different databases in parallel. Um, I would not say that makes it faster. I would say it just makes it different. And it, it's like some things are a little bit different. There are certain commands, for instance, that expect they work across all databases, and this one doesn't. Okay, so what we do is we actually send a message over to that database, and um, now that database process is going to handle it. So here we go. Um, we call run. Uh, gen servers have a thing called call where I say, hey, um, here's the name of my server, here's the command, and here's how much long I want to wait, and they'll actually go and, and uh, run that, it'll pass that message to that gen server it's gonna run. So we're gonna do a gen server call here. Um, that call will actually cause code called handle call to run on the database, and it's now gonna execute the command. So the, the database is gonna say, okay, cool, I got a command, here's my arguments. Um, and you can see here essentially on line 217 that the um, entire sort of database structure is sort of uh, pluggable. In other words, I can write commands to uh, the, um, to my database backend that as long as the backend knows how to handle them, um, we can use any sort of pluggable backend. So in this case, we're using LevelDB, but we don't have to use LevelDB. And in fact, I'll show you guys in a minute, I'm just gonna use the end memory database. So, um, so there we go, so we've done the, the write. Um, that actually causes eLevelDB to do a write. Uh, and these are like the, um, if you guys are familiar with React, the Basho guys wrote bindings for LevelDB uh, that we're using here uh, that are open source. Uh, and then that'll actually, you know, cause that uh, database to command to be run. That gives you a result back. We handle the result in a, in a case. Um, and if you're familiar with Erlang, there are cases everywhere. So we handle that. Uh, we get OK, we turn TCP OK, and we're done. So I'll show you guys an example of that in just a second, actually, just live. So really quick, so we, used, we, uh, we chose level DB just because it's, um, it's pretty fast for a uh, a decent amount of data. Uh, we looked at doing NODB bindings, but we, we aren't using this, uh, we aren't using the database backend right now in production, so we just decided not to worry about it. Uh, a couple people have forked it and add different, added different database backends, like there's a Hanoi DB backend. Hanoi DB is actually a, a pure Erlang version of LevelDB, uh, which is kind of nice, you don't need to, the C drivers. But LevelDB is essentially, um, it's great because it uh, compresses the data, it's fast, and um, one nice thing about Edis is when I write something to Edis and I get the TCP OK, I know it's written to disk. Um, you can do that with Redis, but it's not the default. And people typically don't think of Redis as something that uh, is, um, has any sort of sense of uh, acidity in terms of database writes. Typically, they sort of assume that you know, there's a delay of you know, anywhere from one to 60 seconds before it gets written to disk. So, um, so what's different? So there are a couple of things that uh, basically um, Edis doesn't do. Um, some of the, the functions are database dependent. In other words, when I save, I don't save the whole system. It only saves the database. Um, uh, some of the uh, functions aren't totally implemented. And encoding is really inefficient. So we'll, we'll, I'll show you that in a second. So 
I'm gonna jump into sort of the new stuff that we're working on, uh, the master-slave replication and the multi-master behavior. So uh, with replication, essentially, um, the way it works in, in Redis today is the client, the slave sends a sync command, um, and the master either has the database flush to disk or it will go flush the database to disk. So um, there are sort of two database formats in Redis. Um, one's like an append-only format, like a little bit more like CouchDB, and the other one's a, a RDB format uh, that's proprietary and gets written sort of in line. Um, what happens is whenever you do a, a sync command, you actually get the RDB format. So it'll go build an RDB database, uh, you know, write it out to disk, and then it'll stream it across the wire. So you get this one giant TCP dump. So if you have like, um, this is actually something good to know if you do a lot of Redis stuff and you do a lot of like uh, sync or you know slave up commands. Um, if you have like say like you know uh, 200 you know 100 gigs of data in memory and you do sync, you're just gonna you're just gonna slam your network with that. It's gonna send it every time. If you disconnect and reconnect, it's gonna send the whole thing again. So it's very inefficient. Um, it works well, but it's got some some issues there. So the master may flush it to disk. Um, then the master sends it across the wire to the slave. The slave saves it as a, its new database file, and then now the slave runs essentially a monitor, which just allows you to monitor all the commands. So um, masters can have multiple slaves. And actually, I'm just curious, who here has, been, has done Redis uh, slave uh, configuration before? So some people, a few people here. I mean, it's, it's actually quite powerful. You can have multiple slaves. Slaves can have slaves. Um, slaves can... Um, uh, accept writes, or you can disable that so that you don't accidentally connect to your slave and write data, and now you've got you know two data visits that are out of sync. But you can't do multi-master. So in other words, I can't do set a key on on um, on one server, um, set a different key on the other server, and then get those from the alternate servers. That just doesn't work. Um, it, if I you know say I want to set foo one and get it on the other server, that's not possible. So, excuse me. So uh, there's no multi-master in Redis yet. Now, there's not really a plan for multi-master. Like what he's working on is essentially like a, a sort of um, sharded key space. Uh, it's called Redis cluster um, that allows sort of virtual shards to be mapped across a set of servers. And uh, I think it's actually pretty cool. I, I, I think there's some, the protocol isn't totally baked yet. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm sort of reserving judgment in terms of what, what the, whether it's the right solution for some of the problems that people are having. Um, I do know, for instance, like Pinterest wrote an article recently on how they do um, all of their, their social graph is actually on tons of sharded redises, and they just do it by hand. They sort of have a whole system for it. So um, it's clear that people are having this problem at, at scale. So Edis Multimaster is a little bit different. Um, essentially, uh, we use Gen Server. Gen Server has this really cool thing that if I have a bunch of nodes on different servers, I can just do abcast, and it'll actually find those Gen Servers on all the other connected servers or nodes, and it will actually cast a message to the same server on other servers. So um, um, actually at Whisper we use it a lot for like uh, local cache. So if uh, somebody changes a, or somebody sends something inbound or like a reply or a, a like or something like that, we can broadcast that out to all the other nodes. Um, and it's, uh, it allows you to do this sort of really incredibly simple cross node communication with just one line of code. So um, essentially when I do a set of a key, it broadcasts to all nodes. And uh, it, it uses gen server abcast. So um, if for whatever reason uh, a node missed an update, um, we're using vector clocks to determine that the node is, uh, that that key is out of date. It's not really that you can tell it's out of date, you can just tell it's not a, a child of the key that you, that you just uh, received. So you can kind of tell um, a, a sort of um, ancestry between the keys with, by using vector clocks. Um, there are some issues right now. So like we don't uh, update disconnected nodes on reconnect. And um, uh, so we essentially, um, uh, we will detect, so if we do restart, we do detect that, okay, the last time I connected was um, older than, uh, or sorry, newer than these keys. So I probably, when I need to get a key, I should probably go ask and see if somebody has a newer key. And uh, that works pretty well. So a lot of people ask me sort of what is the cap, is everybody familiar with the cap theorem? Uh, who is not familiar with the cap theorem? Um, so the cap theorem is essentially there, you can sort of put databases into in these sort of three, I actually don't really like the cap theorem, so I hate explaining it, but um, it, the point is basically that uh, databases have sort of uh, three different styles of um, 
of a contract that they offer the, the client. It can be um, two of these three, but never, never all three. It can't be consistent and available and partition tolerant. It's going to not have one of those characteristics. Um, I think my critique of the CAP theorem is that it feels like um, it's almost impossible to be par partition tolerant really anyway. So if you say I'm consistent and partition tolerant, I'm not really sure I believe you. Um, but um, Edis is essentially available and partition tolerant in the sense that um, we are definitely going to return results to you that are inconsistent if there's a disconnect. And um, we're not going to complain. We're not even going to tell you that that's happening. Um, and so I think that's OK. I think that like, the goal right now is just this is almost more a, a research project into sort of how, what, are some, um, what are some spaces for database technology between a key value store like React and a, um, a sort of a very sort of solo node or server um, key value store like Redis. So there maybe there's something, something in between there. So anyway, um, there's a couple other things um, that's, that are coming. One is if you have um, a, a database like this and you want to do things like uh, anchor, like increment, um, it's very hard to increment in a way that makes sense with multi-master because every master is like, oh, sure, you know, great. We had one in the counter, now we have two. And then the other guy's like, oh, yeah, sure, we had three in the counter, now we have four. And they can get out of sync or they can be off by one. It's very, very possible. So um, there's this thing in Erlang called gen leader that allows us to essentially um, pick, take a bunch of servers and elect between them which one is the master node. So now I can um, take all those functions that really need a, a central authority and actually sort of um, decide, okay, great, we're gonna use, you know, uh, we're gonna use this guy to, to, to make that decision. Now there's a ton of issues with doing that, uh, which is why this is a very experimental project. It's, I'm not recommending that you go out and use this, uh, and, uh, particularly if you really need uh, atomicity, because there's just a lot of un, unthought through edge cases here. Um, the other thing we wanna do is replication on reconnect. In other words, just gonna do what, uh, what Redis does. So we can essentially say, hey, give us the whole database, um, and we can either block or we can say, oh, sure, we'll replicate in the background. Like Redis does not allow background replication uh, when you do a sync, but Edis does because its background processes are free in Erlang. Um, and then finally, we're going to do a bunch of um, fi uh, you know, finishing replication for um, a few data types that are missing. Um, we want to do this thing called post commit hooks, which are similar to React that allows you to sort of run code uh, when a key is set or a key is read. And then um, we're going to try to implement Redis cluster as a sort of additional reference implement, not what call it a reference implementation, but an additional implementation of Redis cluster. So, um, yeah, so anyway, that's a you know, pretty quick overview. Um, if you'd like to help, please look at the source. Um, there are a number of benchmarks. Uh, experiment with it. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, it's a really clean uh, and well laid out repository. Um, and uh, I definitely want to say thanks to uh, my intern who did a lot of his thesis work at Uppsala. Uh, on, on this uh, project over the last uh, couple months. So um, what I wanted to do is actually, before we do questions, I'm going to do a quick demo just to kind of show you guys um, how it works and with regard to the master, multi-master stuff. So um, we just fix the... For some reason, when you connect to the Wi-Fi, it says that you're in Japan. I don't know if, did you guys see that? My host name is .jp now. Okay, so I have um, two um, nodes here, and I have two Telnet. Telnet's on the right, and uh, Erlang's on the left. So um, what we can do here is, so these guys are not connected right now. So in Erlang, I can do nodes, and it's going to tell me the world as it sees it. So I'm not actually connected. Um, and I did, I did that just to sort of show you guys how to, um, you can actually set it up where they auto-connect, but it's not doing that right now. Um, So now, actually, they both see each other. So if I do nodes, uh, bro1 here is going to see bro2, and bro2 is going to see bro1. So they know about each other now. So what I can do then is I can, um, if I connect, so this one's running on 6379, and then the other guy's running on 6380. So I can connect, and um, if I do something like now, like, you know, 
um, get, you know, foo, it's going to return. This, this is basically null. Here I can say get foo, it's going to return null. So now I can, like, you know, set foo to, to be bar to, and then I go here, and foo two is going to return it. So then I can actually change it here. Um, Oh, oh, get foo too. I did the wrong thing, sorry. Um, so again, it returns the right thing. So essentially, I can make updates on either one, and they're actually going to um, you know, make, um, allow you to see the results on, on any node. So that's definitely fundamentally different than Redis and something that's, uh, I think, kind of interesting. It's something that there's a lot that we can do and play around with it. Um, I think one of the last things I'll just show you guys, I don't know if, um, um, is you can actually kind of see uh, a little bit more detail in terms of what's happening with the, um, is anybody familiar with Atmon or Narlang? A few people. Has anybody ever seen Atmon before? One, one person? Two? Oh, ten. Okay. So um, essentially what I can do is Erlang has a sort of built-in runtime thing that allows you to see all those servers running. So whenever I started up uh, the app, the application, it shows you each process on the entire system and then what they supervise. So you can see here, uh, this client manager has this one process connected. That's actually my Telnet connection. So if I go in here and I, um, I might be able to do this where you can see them both at the same time. Yeah, I'll drag it out. Um, so what I can do is I actually like disconnect. Uh, hold on. Um, you'll see the connections get cleaned up in that monitor. So if I connect, it's like, okay. Um, you can see it actually like what's happening here. So I can do info, and I can see this is my, uh, um, my client supervisor, and then I can see like, you know, this is my, um, uh, the client, man the command runner. So when I run commands, this is the thing that's actually parsing the command, and that's gonna send a message over here to whichever database I have selected. So not the greatest UI, but it's pretty amazing you can do this. So like you can see each of the database servers are their own process, and those guys are going to handle the commands um, you know, that, that come in from the client. So um, that's pretty much it. I'm going to um, definitely take any questions you guys have. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we can go from there. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, essentially, uh, so currently it's uh, latest wins, um, and it's that's not a super satisfying solution in terms of like where we wanted to get, want to go. So um, we've thought about doing something where it's like I can set some sort of rule that's like, okay, if the key is like you know foo, then I'm going to dump them into foo siblings so I can actually hang on to that data and not lose it. Uh, so the, sorry, I didn't repeat the question, but the question was if, the, um, uh, if you detect an, an error with a vector clock, how do you resolve the conflict? So like in React, uh, you typically have two options. Like you either, um, you either store all the results as siblings, and then whenever somebody asks for a result, it just says, gives you a special HTTP error code and says, uh, which I forget whatever it is, but it says, uh, you know, multiple children or multiple results, and you have to actually uh, look at the results and pick the one you want. Um, in our case, we essentially just blast over the latest one. So um, it's not a great solution, but it's partially because um, I think Redis as a protocol doesn't really have that ability to say, uh, without us kind of going off script, to say, oh, wait, no, 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 we don't know what to do here. Error, multiple children. We could do that. I just didn't want to do that to sort of violate the contract with you know, Redis clients. So any other questions? Yeah. Um, you mean like basically the Lua commands? Yeah. So um, we, we haven't implemented them. We did stick a Lua interpreter in there because there's a couple that are well supported on Erlang, um, but we haven't finished. It's one of those that needs to be implemented. Um, it's not hard because Lua could easily operate on it. The tricky part is um, like some of the, the way we access the database is, is obviously different, and so we'd have to do a decent amount of work to make it you know, work. In Erlang? Yeah, and, and uh, Erlang's kind of designed to, you sort of, 
you can, basically you can do it one of two ways. You can set up, because Lua is really embeddable, you can set up as sort of an in-proc um, thing called a, uh, a NIF, like a um, native implemented function, or there's a thing called a port, which essentially just uh, shells out to Lua running in a sort of a process uh, and handles this sort of mapping state back and forth. Um, I mean, either one would work. I mean, running Lua as a NIF is dangerous because if it crashes, it takes the whole VM down. And Erlang, one of the sort of contracts you get for Erlang is that it doesn't go down. So typically you do it is a slightly slower way, which is essentially you port it and, you, and uh, you just write you know, the Lua library that's in Redis that sort of says, okay, if I ask for a key, I can go actually back out of Erlang, into Erlang, get the key and bring it back. So um, it's a decent amount of work and it'd be awesome if somebody wants to do it. It's just like you know, pretty low on our list, so. Any other questions? Um, that's a really good question. Like, ease of implementation was one, and the idea was you could you could maybe use different database backends. Um, it's probably a bad idea because it changes a lot of the behaviors of some of those commands. So, uh, because in other words, the saves and some of those things aren't quite the same. So, we thought about undoing it, but you know, right now it just sort of is what it is. Um, I mean, it's a little bit more efficient in the sense that if you have different people hitting the different databases um, and they're all in one gen server, like if every database call was in one gen server, gen servers are sort of blocking, if you will, when there's something being running in that gen server. In other words, messages come in, they get queued up in the mailbox, and then they get executed by that gen server um, as they come in. So if I'm setting sit, sets and gets and everything, it's going to sort of, they're all going to queue up. Whereas if they're in separate databases, they could be running on different processors and they won't sort of block each other. Um, but it does sort of fundamentally change the semantics of it. So it's a little bit, you know, unusual. So you're still going to be gated by one of those like little push back database. You are, if you use, yeah, if you use level, you are, yes. Um, I mean, you could, like in the in memory case, you, you aren't. But I mean, I really wouldn't use Edis for in memory in the sense that, um, if you expect it to behave like Redis, I mean, Redis does back everything up to disk every 30 seconds, and we don't do that at all. It's actually more dangerous. So uh, it's fun to play around with, but it's better if you're gonna use it to just use the disk store. So yeah, that's a good point. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably better to use one. Uh, I mean, don't round robin. Partially because, um, you know, yeah, if you have a net split, you're obviously going to start, you're going you're gonna to have some data inconsistency, right? So um, at least the client, if it knows it lost connection to that server, can handle the fact that it's like, wait, something's wrong. I can't hit the server anymore. So maybe my guarantees as to what's in there are, are now changed. Whereas if I'm round robining, I don't, I don't really know, right? Um, I mean, we do detect, like, if, 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 if you look on here, if I drop the node, the other nodes notice it right away. It's instant. I mean, it's part of the, the great thing about Erlang is uh, that that's built in. So, like, essentially, when I, um, if I kill one of these nodes, it's going to, like, um, you know, you're going to see it. It's going to be too hard to show you, sorry. Um, but uh, you'll see it right away. So it'd be very easy to handle that case on the, on the server side. Like, whoa, I just lost a node. Okay, all guarantees are off. Throw an alert. Call, call a Reese saying, do whatever you need to do. Um, so, uh, any other questions? Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot. I uh, appreciate your time and great questions.